40% of America's workforce today works in non-traditional long-term employment. They're contingent employees, part-time, temporary, gig workers. We've got to make sure we meet the workforce where it is in the 21st century, not the 20th century. Welcome to Washington Post Live and our discussion today on the future of work. I'm Heather Long, an economics correspondent at The Post, and today we have a really neat discussion about what jobs in the workforce are going to look like. What are they going to look like as we come out of COVID? And what are they going to look like in 10 years down the road? We'll have uh, Lyft CEO, or excuse me, Lyft president and co-founder John Zimmer coming up later. But first, we we'll start with Mark Warner, the senator from Virginia. He's a Democrat, he's a businessman, he's a former governor of Virginia, and he's been a leading voice on talking about what the gig economy and the future of work looks like. He just put out a white paper today on this very subject. So welcome, Senator Warner. Heather, thank you for having me this morning. So I wanna get to your white paper and your, your latest proposals, but first I gotta ask you, uh, you've probably seen these comments from Bill Gates, Microsoft founder, who predicted recently that over 50% of business travel and over 30% of office time were going to go away, that these were going to be permanent changes even after this pandemic is over. That's a lot of change. Do you agree with him? Well, I agree, broadly speaking, um, that automation and technology was going to transform. 30 to 40 percent of our workforce uh, and whether bill is right on those specific numbers for uh, traditional office working or um, uh, business travel what COVID has done is accelerated the move towards a digital economy literally by probably a decade over the last 10 months and that's going to mean we're going to be rethinking our cities we're going to be rethinking certain business businesses and it also means that there's going to be a large chunk of our workforce that has been dislocated, that is not coming back to work. And, and while my white paper today focuses on portable benefits, the next, the next round of that white paper will focus on how we redefine the tax, accounting, and reporting investment businesses make in human capital. Right now, we, we advantage investments that businesses make in technology and tangible goods. A company buys a robot, you get a tax write-off, that robot's an asset, you can report on your balance sheet. Company trains a human being to be more efficient than a robot, and you don't get a tax credit. It's simply viewed as an expense. It is not treated on an equal basis. So we're going to need to dramatically rethink the whole notion of workforce training and investment in human beings if we're not going to have leave a whole series of traditional workers who are being disrupted, not only by COVID, but by technology far behind. Yeah, we've got a lot to dig into about what that future looks like. But I want to ask you briefly about the pandemic situation. And in particular, you're part of a bipartisan group that's put together a proposal for more stimulus, more aid for this winter for the economy, about 900 billion. It's getting a lot of buzz. What's the biggest hurdle to getting this done? Well, I just literally was on the call with the, we're now up to 10 members, five Democrats, five Republicans, a lot of additional interest, because I think we all recognize, I'm calling it stupidity on steroids, if Congress were to break before Christmas and then have people lose their unemployment benefits the day after Christmas, small businesses exhaust their PPP funds, people be pushed out of their apartments without rental assistance come January. And what we worked on and continue to work on is the Democrats, of which I'm proud to be, are not going to get the $2 trillion. A Leader McConnell's plan at, at $500 billion does not provide assistance for hospitals or state and local government or a host of other areas, nursing homes, that is needed. So we came up and, and have tried to formulate a um, place in the middle that would be not full stimulus, because we didn't include $1,200 checks, but a four-month bridge to get to the Biden administration and not leave people in this economy hanging. I think it would get overwhelming support. We've got to convince the majority leader to bring it um, to the floor. Uh, and I think, I, I feel you know, lots of twists and turns to go through, but I feel a lot better about that today 
than I did even two days ago, because I think um, the number of Republican senators who've come up uh, privately and increasingly coming out publicly to say, hey, this kind of plan, plus or minus uh, a little bit, um, is really important. And I think what we've got with the 10 of us is we're all willing to kind of hang in at that $908 billion number, uh, and then we can work through um, uh, how we get the categories right. I want to ask you specifically, we're here obviously talking about workers and the future of work. Do you think there is enough in this in this deal, bipartisan deal, for workers to help both unemployed workers and to help workers who need to retrain? Well, I think we've done well with unemployment. We are doing the traditional unemployment plus the $300 bump up. We're also continuing uh, probably the area that I was most interested in in the first CARES bill the expansion of unemployment to cover those non-traditional W-2 workers um, so that we're covering gig workers, we're covering independent contractors, we're covering part-time uh, folks so they get some coverage. I think that's critically important. We also provide additional money, for example, for airlines, uh, for transit, uh, for small businesses to make sure that people will not be um, seeing as much being laid off uh, during these uh, critically challenging months for venues like restaurants and, and um, uh, group venues, Save Our Stages, for example, will be a component part. We are not in this bill because it is focused on the four months, really taking on what I think is going to be the massive retraining, the broad-based re based reappraisal of how we think about investment in human capital. That's going to have to be left for a, a later discussion. Got it. Let me ask you about two specifics on workers. And you mentioned uh, what's known as the PUA or the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance for gig workers and self-employed. We've seen millions of people use this program who wouldn't normally be eligible for unemployment aid. Uh, it's unclear to people, does your bipartisan group proposal include extending that PUA past December 31st? And the other question I get a lot is, you all have pitched an additional $300 for the unemployed on top of what they would normally receive. Uh, is that retroactive? A lot of people didn't get that money you know, from August, September, October, November, December, or would that only apply in the winter months? Well, uh, first of all, the top line question is, yes, the PUA, the gig worker coverage will be um, extended. Uh, the second, we're still debating back and forth whether we go retroactive from December 1st to March 31st or whether we go prospective from January 1st to April 30th. Um, that's still to be worked out. So there's no looking going back um, retroactive back to you know, October, November, September, although many states did take advantage of the Trump advantage, the Trump dollars for the $300 a week pump up. Um, I also think back on the the unemployment, this really gets to the heart of what I, I know we don't have all that much more time, but uh, I hope we can get to, which is, can we think about a new social contract? I mean, traditionally, the social contract that came about in the 1930s and 1940s in America was, you go work for a firm long term, you're going to get unemployment, you're going to get health care, you'll get some level of, of uh, retirement, you lose work uh, or get hurt at work, you'll get disability as well as unemployment. And that worked pretty well for the vast majority of workers until the early 2000s. And then as people started going into these alternative work arrangements uh, and started going into even their traditional W-2 employees, moving from one job to another, think about our kids, or at least my kids, you know, none of them are going to work for the same firm the way my dad did for 38 years. We need to make sure that social contract catches up. And that's the focus of my white paper today to create the level of portability of these benefits and benefits that will accrue as you move from one job to another or one gig to another. Um, the most major step forward in this direction, Heather, as you know, was the expansion of unemployment in COVID to cover the gig workers. My hope is uh, that we need to maintain that, uh, that expansion, but we also need to really focus on the portability so that uh, you actually start accruing some level of benefits from that first hour of work how the split between worker and payor, I'm not even saying employer, because that gets into the whole classification debate, but payor um, plays out. We ought to experiment. We ought to give states some flexibility uh, to try different models. I think we've still got to work through that. 
Um, but it's really where I hope the debate moves. Yeah. So, okay, break it down a little bit more for people. You know, if they're a worker, uh, explain this portable benefit concept. Like at the moment, I work at the Washington Post. I get my health care through the Washington Post. I have a retirement plan that, that runs through the Post. You know, for, for a worker like me who's used to those more traditional benefits, how would your system be different? Well, for a worker like you who's, who's a traditional longer-term W-2 employee, it wouldn't be that much different. But what we've seen is corporation after corporation, including even folks like the Post, who decided that anyone who is non-essential may, in a sense, get outsourced, not literally to outsourced to their job to China, but they no longer qualify as an employee. This has particularly happened with janitorial staff. It's happened with cafeteria workers. Uh, I think about some of the companies who've done right by their employees, but then you ask about these roles that 30 years ago would have been viewed as a corporate employee. Now they're an outsourced employee. And oftentimes that outsourced employee does not come with any benefits package. I think that's wrong. I think we see the vulnerabilities of what happens when something like COVID happens and, and literally millions of Americans are caught without any safety net. Uh, we've seen the Fed, Federal Reserve documentation that showed that even before COVID, uh, close to 45% of Americans couldn't absorb a $400 unexpected bill without either going into bankruptcy or having to borrow from a relative. Uh, we need to create a 21st century social contract. So um, these benefits start accruing from day one and they're portable. In many ways, the biggest benefit of Obamacare was portability of health care. Uh, so mm -hmm. you were not tied to that employer-related effort. The expansion of unemployment uh, to cover gig workers is another step in, in, in that direction. Uh, retirement, you know, we've got this flurry of retirement accounts out there, but we've got a proposal in our white paper that would create a default retirement account, we call it PREA, that would travel with you from literally your first job. Uh, and as you move from job to job, any benefits you'd accrued on retirement would default into this account. Um, we do need to make sure, no matter what kind of work you do, and not get totally caught up in the classification, there is a minimum wage. So I'm strongly supportive of moving towards that $15 minimum wage. But how we build this new social net or social contract, how we make sure that we think you know, what ought to be included, for example, having giving a worker um, some funds they could turn to uh, when they need to retrain, it should be part, I believe, should be part of that new uh, uh, portable benefits package. Um, but this is where we need the kind of experimentation. We've spent so much time focused on 20th century worker classification battle when we ought to be moving into the 21st century, recognize we're not going back to where somebody's going to work as you do, Heather, full time for a single employer for maybe the, the majority of your career. People are going to move around and we need to meet the workforce where they're at. And we see from the debate and the worker classification issues, even a very progressive state like California. And obviously, the platform companies spent a lot of money to get their case out yeah. there. But, but the fact that 58% of Californians said um, they don't want to force everybody back into a 20th century model uh, ought to give us, and particularly Democrats and, and even my you know, more progressive brethren, uh, pause about how we think about, you know, let's not fight 20th century battles. Let's make sure workers in 2020 and going forward have the benefits and the portability they need. Yeah. Let me ask you one more thing about portable benefits. Just to explain to me. There doesn't seem to be much debate that the safety net needs to be bigger, that we don't want people falling through. Where the debate seems to be is, you know, who pays for these different benefits? So like that janitor example who might work for an outsourced company now, you know, does is it fall on the government to, to pay for most of his benefits or her benefits or, or should the company be forced to contribute more who isn't at the moment paying any benefits to this worker? I I absolutely believe the company needs to be forced as well as the worker needs to make a contribution. In many ways, that is somewhat of the format explicit or implicit in the existing W-2 uh, working relationship. We need to be clearer about uh, on a going forward basis um, that there ought to be contributions um, from both the worker and the payor empo employer. You know, could there be a governmental piece that would incent that? I, I'm open to experimentation on that. And who is that group then 
that manages these portable benefits. It could be a 21st century union. It could be some level yeah. of new public private partnership. It could be um, you know, technology companies that might emerge uh, to manage uh, and have a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, but clearly, this is not something that a, a worker and the government alone um, are going to have to are going to be able to take on. The payor or employer uh, needs to be kicking in uh, and kicking in, I believe, from that first hour of uh, a worker's work time. Got it. So you brought up Proposition 22, the California uh, initiative that just passed pretty overwhelmingly, 58 percent by voters. We're going to talk a lot with the Lyft president soon about this. But you know, broadly speaking, Proposition 22 said that these Lyft drivers, Uber drivers, DoorDash drivers should be classified as independent contractors and not employees. Uh, do you support Proposition 22? Listen, I think, I wish we wouldn't have had to get to the position where you needed a Proposition 22. I support shared responsibility. And I support experimentation at the state level. I think spending, as somebody who views himself as a worker advocate, to spend all our time trying to fit every work arrangement back into a 20th century traditional model, I think that's backwards thinking. Uh, I think we need to have forwards thinking. And that says, you know, let's not stress on classification. Let's stress on making sure workers get a suite of benefits. And some of those benefits are going to be different than 20th century. I do think a retraining component um, has to be part of that benefit bucket. And if you if we thought differently about investment in human capital and actually incented companies to invest in their human capital, right now there's actually a tax and accounting disincentive to uh, investing in human capital. It's much you get much better rewarded to invest in a tangible good, a piece of R and D, a robot rather than a human being. I think we can we can get this balance right. And I would say back again, I, one of the examples I should have cited a little bit earlier, there are examples of portable benefits that accrue as a worker moves from, from position to position. We've seen that in the Screen Actors Guild and in the whole movie business since the 1930s. We've seen that in many ways in the construction industries, the unionized construction industries. So we're not talking about an idea that is so radically different and that there's not existing 20th century models that we can build. All right, I've got two minutes and two final questions for you. So obviously we've got a new administration coming into the White House in January. Who would you like to see Biden pick as labor secretary? Heather, do I look like a fool? Do you think I'm going to weigh in on that? You know, I'm not going to. I, I hope that the, I hope President Biden, President-elect Biden will choose someone who is forward thinking that does believe that we've got to rethink the social contract, that believes and acknowledges that people are going to move from job to job and gig to gig. And we not people who do that shouldn't be penalized in terms of the benefits they receive. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, I'm anxious to see uh, his choice. Uh you probably know Andrew Yang's pitch to do a, a guaranteed income, something like $1,000 a month to all Americans. What's your take on that universal basic income? Uh, Michael Croxton from Washington State asks, is a guaranteed income inevitable? Listen, I think Andrew is one of the smartest guys uh, I've had a chance to deal with over the last couple of years. And you know, I'm not fully in at the, on the UBI at this point. Um, but I think conceptually, this idea that Americans need some safety net to fall back on uh, during challenging times or to invest in themselves in terms of future training um, makes a lot of sense. I, I might approach it a little bit differently. And I, I actually think this idea around investment in workers in terms of human capital, tax accounting and reporting, and combine that with the idea that no matter what kind of work you do, Benefits ought to be attached, and those benefits ought to be accruing um, regardless of whether you work in a position for 20 years or um, 20 months are, are the kind of forward-thinking areas where I've actually got bipartisan Republican support on my portable benefits bill. So I think that we might, if we can get out of the 20th century kind of conservative versus liberal um, mindset and really think about this as a future past framework, I think we can get there a lot easier. And frankly, 
Um, that's been one of the most refreshing things about Andrew. He's always willing to think in that future past mindset. And while I may, again, may not be fully in it at this point on UBI, I think directionally, this idea yeah. of everyone having something to fall back on makes a lot of sense. Uh, let me ask you, lastly, uh, President-elect Biden announced his economic team this week to a lot of fanfare. Uh, but, you know, one person has, has gotten a little bit of pushback from the Republican side, Biden's choice to run the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, near a Tandon. Do you think she will be confirmed? Kind of what's your argument for her to be in that top economic post job? Well, Nira is extraordinarily bright. I've worked with her for years uh, when she was at CAP. Um, she also, her personal story, uh, of someone who was raised by a single parent, had to rely on a lot of the public assistance programs that OMB um, manages. I think it would actually be extraordinarily refreshing to have someone who's benefited from these packages and, and some of these government programs be uh, as the chief at OMB. And um, I don't, you know, and I find it a little bit hypocritical of my Republican friends who are complaining about her tweeting. Um, you know, I tend to dismiss people's tweetings, whether they're on the left or the right. Uh, and I don't think that's the standard, particularly uh, with Mr. Trump. Um, and, I, and I think, again, what we've seen, Nira, get some grief already from both the right and the left. And if you're getting grief from both ends, maybe that means uh, uh, you're worthy of some review. And I just hope my Republican colleagues will keep an open mind and get a chance to sit down and meet with her first before they make any determination. Thank you, Senator Warner. We really appreciate your time, and I encourage people to read your white paper that's just come out today. Thank you so much, Heather. Really appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll have a short message from our sponsors, and then we'll be back with Lyft President John Zimmer. Hello, I'm Elise Labid from American University, and today we're talking about ensuring workers have access to benefits that work for them and the moment. The COVID pandemic has led to unpredictable work and a reliance on the gig economy. How can we create a system where vulnerable workers have access to benefits regardless of their work arrangement and employment status? To talk about this, I'm joined by Shamina Singh, president of MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, the philanthropic hub of MasterCard. Card. She also serves as the company's executive vice president, corporate sustainability. Shamina, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So you you're in the private sector now, but you've worked with labor unions, home care workers on the front lines, and in government. What changes have you observed in this COVID pandemic period, specifically when it comes to the gig economy? You're right. I've worked at a lot of places and in a lot of sectors. But I'll tell you the one thing that hasn't changed is that everyone wants the stability, ability, and dignity to reach their full potential and take care of themselves and their families. The things that I have noticed that are changing are pretty alarming. You know, 86% of the jobs that were displaced by COVID paid less than $40,000 per year um, and disproportionately affected, obviously, part time workers, women and communities of color. So folks are really walking a tightrope right now. And I think um, there's a lot of work that we need to do to help. I think one of the things is a lot of people are afraid to lose their jobs or venture to another career because they're so their benefits are so important to their financial security. So given this economic uncertainty, how do we redesign benefits that are more people-centric and workers can access over the course of their career regardless of the type of work they're doing, say gig worker or even a self-employed individual? You know, that's the, I think that's the unique uh, part of what, where we're living right now. You said meet the moment. Right now we have the technology um, to ensure that a people-centric approach that is also uh, tech enabled will allow workers to experience benefits that work for them. The technology can work for them, not against them. And so we can create a portable benefit system platform that would allow workers to accrue, redeem, 
and use benefits like health insurance, paid time off, disability, life insurance, all of those fragmented streams um, can come together on one platform that really serve the worker and not the other way around. You know, it, that portability does give workers that financial security. They don't have to stay tethered to a company. They can train, they can change jobs, start a business without losing their benefits. So let's be more specific about what a portable benefit system look like. I recently read an article you wrote that countries like France and Singapore already have systems like this. They have, um, they have programs, right? So they, what they have done, which is quite interesting, is they are using their uh, fiscal dollars, their stimulus package in some sense, to put the, uh, the money in the hands of the workers so that they are allowed to choose what kind of training they want, um, what kind of skills they're looking for to get to the next level. So in that sense, there's a people-centric approach that is certainly uh, taking hold. What we're sort of saying now is, let's also add that technology approach to ensure that those dollars are spent in the best and most efficient way to not only serve uh, the taxpayer, but also serve the citizen and the user. It seems with COVID, the time is now, and I'm sure the government has a role to play, but with all the investment in technology and innovation in the private sector, I would think public-private partnerships um, are key oh. here. So what can we look for in 2021 in terms of working out a system with these type of portable benefits? Well, I think it's back where we started the conversation. You said, you know, I've spent half my career in the government and public sector, and I've spent half my career in the private sector. And the thing that I know about both is that if they bring their complementary assets together to serve their consumer, the customer, the taxpayer, the worker, um, we can get this right in, uh, faster than we think. And so I think this idea of bringing the technology innovation, innovation from the private sector along with the will and the mandate from the government and certainly depth and breadth of their, themselves as an employer, we can move very much faster for all workers. Well, I've heard you say at MasterCard that if you want to walk a tightrope, you'll probably think twice about doing it if there isn't that net below you. So if we want workers not only to thrive, um, thrive, not just survive, um, to pursue their career ambitions and fulfill their potential, then we have to have that safety net that looks beyond those kind of traditional ways of looking employer-employee relationships and, and make the digital economy work for everyone. Shamina Singh, president of MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth and executive vice president of corporate sustainability from MasterCard. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now back to the Washington Post. I'm Heather Long, an economics correspondent at the Washington Post, and we're continuing our discussion on the future of work. And now we have someone who's been a key player in the gig economy, and that is co-founder and president of the ride share company Lyft, John Zimmer. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. So there was big news in the rideshare business on election day, and I'm not just talking about the presidential election, but as you know well, in California, voters went to the polls and also had to decide on something called Proposition 22, or Prop 22 for short, where they got to vote on whether Lyft drivers and other rideshare drivers should be considered employees of your company or independent contractors. As you know, that Proposition 22 was approved with 58% of the vote and people voted in favor of making drivers independent contractors. Um, my question for you is, a lot of people saw your stock price and other rideshare company stock prices soar after that vote. And they kind of look at that and they say, you know, is this Prop 22 just benefiting investors and maybe not so good for workers? 
how do you respond to that kind of criticism? Yeah, I'd say look at look at what drivers, uh, you know, supported six to one want to be independent contractors. Voters nearly 60 percent supported the measure. Uh, we can have both independence, meaning drivers can drive whenever, wherever they want, uh, and they can and should have benefits. So we created a new model. It's a significant turning point for this discussion. Uh, you know, the Lyft platform uh, served approximately 1% of the U.S. workforce over the last year, providing a safety net. You know, people often argue uh, about the safety net, which is a good discussion and a, a valuable discussion. Part of the new safety net is the ability to turn on and off work whenever you want. Uh, there's MIT study that recently came out and that showed that uh, people that had the ability to work on platforms like Lyft were less likely to need unemployment insurance. Uh, and so uh, we're excited about the new model. We're ready to push it forward with other uh, states uh, and we're ready to continue listening and working with parties uh, within labor uh, and within the government. Would you really have stopped operating in California if Prop 22 had not been approved? We, we were looking at all options. Uh, it, it really was not good for uh, obviously the company, but, but really drivers. Uh, if if it went the route of uh, employees. Uh, as you saw in that upfront video, the majority of drivers on the Lyft platform are driving less than 20 hours. And when you have a rigid uh, employment system applied to a type of work that people use in a variety of different ways, it can have unintended consequences. And so uh, we're, we're happy that uh, voters stood with drivers. Uh, we're happy that it was a very decisive answer of nearly 60 percent and we're happy there's a new model uh you know as senator warner said portable benefits are something that this country should be looking at should be doing uh, and we want to be helpful in that effort so you've mentioned that you would like to work with other states or maybe even national lawmakers to try to see something like this enacted across the country uh, obviously, two prominent people who said they were against Prop 22 were Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris. Uh, how do you convince them that they should change their minds and, and look again at something like Prop 22? Yeah, well, Pre President-elect Biden has two main priorities that, that we've heard and seen. You know, one is uh, COVID uh, and getting a handle and getting people healthy uh, and getting that uh, resolved as much as possible. And two is a broad-based economic recovery. Lyft is on the front lines of both of those. Uh, and we want to help on both of those. On COVID, uh, we're working uh, with healthcare providers to be sure that we can help provide safe and affordable rides uh, or no-cost rides with partners uh, to get the vaccine. And on the economic recovery, as I mentioned, uh, this is a really important part. The, the gig economy, as people refer to it, uh, but the Lyft platform is a very important part of uh, an economic recovery, and we want to add benefit. Independent contractors in the United States have not had access to benefit. What happened with Prop 22 was groundbreaking. It wasn't just us saying, no, we don't want AB5 or we don't want employment. It was saying uh, we should have a new model that provides both independence and benefits. Uh, and I think that's something a lot of people uh, got behind, again, with 60% of the vote, but also that uh, you know, the federal government can get behind. So, you know, you said something interesting on a podcast at Axios last month. Uh, you said, as the economy shifts and changes, we should also be able to add benefits for in independent contractors without forcing drivers into the rigidia rigidity of employment. So this idea you keep talking to us about that there should be a third way between independent contractor, you know, being a full-time employee, that there should be something in between. Uh, do you think drivers need more benefits than what's in Prop 22? You know, a lot of people say, okay, it gives a little bit, but not many benefits. Yeah, well, let's be clear on what it does provide. It provides a earnings guarantee of 120% of minimum wage for the time they're engaged, either on their way to a passenger or with a passenger. It provides a healthcare subsidy. If you drive 15 hours or more, that covers 50% uh, of the Obamacare healthcare costs and 100% if you drive 25 hours or more. Uh, it provides occupational accident insurance um, and, and disability protections. And so it is a, a great set of benefits that scale with uh, someone's work and the number of hours that they work. I think there can be even greater flexibility uh, as we look forward. Uh, one of the concepts that I believe Senator Warner 
uh, has discussed, uh, as others have discussed, uh, and he's been, frankly, the leader on this issue of portable benefits, uh, is a savings account uh, that a driver, in this case, a worker, can draw down on for various needs, including health care, including you know, potentially retirement, uh, including days off. So I think greater flexibility uh, and having in a type of account that allows them to use the benefits in the best way for them uh, would be another positive step forward. Hmm. One of the things Senator Warner brought up is he was instrumental in getting a lot of drivers on your platform and, and other rideshare companies, getting them unemployment benefits during this COVID pandemic when a lot of people had to stop driving, uh, certainly during the spring months. Uh, that was funded by the government, and whereas most unemployment insurance is, is funded partly by companies. Uh, do, do you think that your company should be paying more going forward for unemployment insurance? Well, that, yeah, that's the exact uh, type of thing that we try to unlock with Prop 22, is a mechanism such that companies can pay for and pay into a benefits package uh, while retaining drivers' rights of being an independent contractor. Uh, so definitely something we're open to, to continue exploring uh, with the federal government, uh, with leaders like Senator Warner. And I'd also just you know, note what I said before, there was a, a recent MIT study that uh, showed drivers uh, were less likely to need unemployment insurance if they had the ability to turn on and off work like Lyft. Uh, and that's because if they're doing something either full time that is not Lyft uh, or part time that is not Lyft and that work subsides, uh, they can dial up uh, the amount of work they do on platforms like Lyft. Yeah, yeah. But although it was harder during the pandemic, obviously. Um, let's talk yeah, a little bit about, uh, yeah, about the COVID situation. Uh, I believe ride volume has been cut in, in half, or at least it was earlier in this year. What are you seeing lately where, where, um, as COVID cases rise again? Are, are you starting to see fewer rides as COVID cases rise? Yeah, I mean, at its peak, uh, the, the business, the rideshare business was down 75%. Uh, we're now, as you mentioned, back at around 50%. Month to month, that can change uh, a few percent. We just put out an update yesterday. Uh, it had changed down 2% uh, approximately. So we're definitely seeing an impact uh, of, of uh, the virus. Um, and, it, and it does depend city by city, state by state uh, on uh, how, the, how the virus is uh, being handled. Yeah. How do you handle riders who don't wear masks? I know you, you know, you say on your app you should have a mask, but I've talked to drivers who, and I'm sure you have too, who say, you know, somebody gets in my car and they don't have a mask. I try to ask them to put it on and they refuse. Yeah, so as you know, we, we added a health certification for both drivers and riders that asked drivers and riders to self-certify that they are wearing a mask. If a, a driver or rider is reported as not doing so, uh, there's a second step, mask, uh, mask verification, uh, where um, the camera actually opens up and checks to see uh, and asks them to, to scan uh, to make sure they do have a mask. Uh, and we're seeing much higher compliance with that uh, type of feature going forward. So we're going to keep pushing health safety. It's something that we've led on, uh, and it's something that has resulted in the ability to have self, uh, I'm sorry, have healthy uh, rideshare rides uh, during a pandemic when people are concerned about getting into. I'd say a more busy type of transit situation. Mm. The Marriott CEO recently told me that he didn't think hotel occupancy and mm -hmm. companies like his would be back to you know, pre-COVID levels until 2023 or 2024. He thinks it's going to take a long time. Um, how quickly do you think rideshare volumes will be back to something more like what, what was normal you know, a year ago? It's really hard to predict. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, a lot of people have got in trouble for predicting incorrectly how a pandemic uh, is going to impact business or impact society. You know, what I can say is that uh, the fact that we still have 50 percent of rides uh, with, you know, the, the peak of the virus in, in our country uh, means that this is very important transportation. We're actually seeing as a share of rides overall, a higher percentage of rides being taken by obvious situations like essential workers uh, who, again, need to trade from a transit situation to a, a healthier or safer environment that they can get with rideshare. In terms of when it will be back, 
uh, to where it was pre-COVID. I, I don't know for sure. I think it'll be faster than uh, 2023, 2024. Um, and, and we're optimistic that, that we'll see it, you know, hopefully once the vaccine is distributed middle of next year. Yeah, uh, I know we're all ready for those vaccines. Um, so thinking longer term, you once raised a lot of eyebrows when you predicted that there's probably going to be an end to personal car ownership, that you know, I might not have my own car anymore. Uh, has, have your views changed on that? Do you still think that a day will come in our lifetimes when you know, we won't own our, own our own cars anymore? Absolutely. I have a daughter who's about to turn five and, and one that's a one and a half. Uh, and I believe that uh, they will not uh, need to own a car ever in their lives. Uh, and that's not just because I don't want them to be uh, driving. Uh, it's because I actually believe it, it's going to be better for society. It's going to be a better financial decision for uh, individuals. The average American household spends $9,000 every year owning and operating a car that they use 4% of the time. That is not uh, where it should be. Uh, we can provide the freedom of transportation without the cost and burden uh, of the $9,000 every year. Uh, we've made uh, progress on that. Every year, about 250,000 uh, Lyft users get rid of a car. I think families typically go from a two-car household to a one-car household before they go to zero. Uh, but we have much more coming. We've added to the platform our bike share systems, like in uh, New York and the DC area. Uh, we've added car rentals to the service. Uh, and we're gonna continue providing a, a portfolio of transportation that you can subscribe to, just like you get your music, you no longer own CDs, you no longer own DVDs, you stream these services. The same thing will happen with transportation. It's gonna take a bit longer because uh, it's a bigger opportunity and it's a bigger behavior change, uh, but it will definitely happen. And who do you think will own those cars then? Like, would your service own them or do you think the car companies will? I think there'll be an intermediary uh, that'll be a financial organization. It could be the car companies, uh, but it will be a, a new form of financing, basically, that will have these large fleets of millions of vehicles. Uh, and, then, um, uh, and then they will be operated on platforms like Lyft. Got it. All right. I have to admit, when I said I was interviewing you, I got deluged with people texting me questions, emailing me questions, tweeting me questions. So I want to do a little bit of a rapid fire in the next few minutes here. Kind of shorter answers. Get through as many of these as we can. Um, here's a fun one. What are Lyft's plans to participate in air taxis? Any flying taxis or airplanes? Yeah, um, not, not, not really. We're going to stay on the ground. Uh, I call those helicopters. I know other people call them flying cars, like our competitor. Uh, but it looks like they're, they're recent news looking to get rid of that part of their business. I think it's interesting, but uh, we are, we're staying with our, our feet and wheels on the ground for now. Got it. Um, here's another one. A lot of people said they chose Lyft over Uber because Lyft was the first to allow driver tipping. And that's why they stayed with your platform thinking it was better for drivers. Now, obviously, Uber does tipping too. So why should customers pick Lyft? Yeah, tipping is one example of our belief that taking care of drivers is not only the right thing to do, uh, but, but it's also good for building the best platform. Uh, my background's in hospitality. Uh, I, I went to hotel school, uh, and, and to me, the best hospitality uh, starts with taking care of drivers, uh, and we've done that. Tipping is one example. Uh, same day pay, uh, where and, and now instantaneous pay, where when the ride is complete, it goes into a, a debit card. Uh, we're continuing to push the envelope. We have a few more things coming for drivers, uh, and uh, overall, we'll provide a better uh, brand experience for both drivers and riders. Uh, that has better hospitality than our competition. Okay, here's another one. Uh, will plastic barriers and mask mandates remain after you know, after the vaccines are out next year? I mean, my, my hope is that as a society, I mean, this is way broader than Lyft, as a society, we're gonna be able to move past this at some point next year, uh, and that those type of mandates will be unnecessary because enough of the population is vaccinated. So that's my hope. But again, with, with COVID, uh, I will not make too many predictions. How much longer will you have drivers? I, you know, I think we will. Yeah, I think this is counterintuitive. Uh, and I know the question is around autonomous vehicles. I don't think we will ever need less drivers than we have today. Uh, wow. That's the part that's counterintuitive. Um, yeah. 
if you think about the majority of rides that are happening broadly in, in cars outside of Lyft, uh, it is people driving themselves uh, to work. Um, and, and Lyft and Uber represent one to 2% of miles traveled in the United States. So as this scales, as we go from transportation ownership to transportation as a service, we will need both more drivers as well as autonomous vehicles over the next 10 years. Uh, and even you could say, okay, John, but at some point, maybe 20 years from now, when you can only drive cars in an amusement park and where uh, every, every vehicle is autonomous, what about then? I think we will still need drivers, uh, or in this case, they will become hosts in the vehicles providing uh, service, providing safety uh, for vehicles that have over six passengers. So uh, again, from a hospitality background, I think of that as the future, we're gonna have rooms on wheels. Uh, it's gonna be less like a car uh, and there's gonna be a, a big uh, work need. Yeah. How about any future plans to provide education benefits or tuition assistance to drivers? A lot of people asked about, you know, is there a way to upskill these drivers? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. We, we've done some work around online education and online training. Uh, it was actually a benefit that drivers uh, didn't, uh, you know, opt into when they had alternatives. And so I think what portable benefits, the power of portable benefits and the account that I, I talked about and that leaders like Senator Warner have talked about is, let's provide them with an account with dollars such that they can apply it to where they need it the most. Uh, and for, for many that, that may be education and that is something that should be part of that benefits account so that they could apply it to education. Yeah. Some ask, why isn't Lyft doing food delivery business like the Uber Eats uh, or moving into the freight, you know, doing trucks? Yeah, our, our mission is improve people's lives with the world's best transportation. Uh, we are focused on consumer transportation. The problem that I mentioned of Americans spending more money on their car than they do on food, than they do on health care, uh, and they only use it 4% of the time. Uh, I think it's a big enough problem. It's an important enough problem. Uh, to me, it's more important than food delivery, uh, and it's more valuable to society. I don't think society needs another food delivery company. That said, for drivers, in order to make sure we lift the platform, create enough work opportunities, uh, we are pursuing B2B delivery, which is basically saying, hey, for retailers, for restaurants that don't want to pay the 20 to 30% commission to Uber Eats, uh, that they can uh, work with us and provide uh, delivery services, but we're not going to build a consumer platform for uh, for food delivery. Got it. Okay, here's another one. Um, so you were very supportive of a number of Democratic candidates in the last election. And people say, you know, one of the Democratic platforms right now is to tax millionaires more. You know, you're someone who's done very well for yourself. Do you support raising taxes on millionaires? Absolutely. I think the, uh, you know, uh, earned income tax credit uh, should go up for people earning less money, meaning they should keep more of it. Uh, and I think people that, that have more, more money should be taxed more. It's, it's quite simple. Uh, it's, it's good for uh, society. It's good for the economy. Uh, and clearly, uh, right now, there's a need for more equitable outcomes. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful that President-elect Biden uh, will pursue paths like that. Hmm. Uh, this one came up a lot, or some version of this. This is actually a reader from France, Joel Luboff, who wrote this one. He says, how many hours per week do you expect a Lyft driver to work in order to gain a living wage and save for a decent retirement? Uh, so Lyft is not currently in France yet, but we, we hope to get there. So I, I can't pretend to know what the living wage uh, is in France, but it's really a kind of modular system that if someone is filling in five hours a week, you know, to take care of maybe they're paying off a student loan or maybe they're saving for uh, an unexpected expense, um, that's a very good kind of use case for the platform, that five, 10, 20 hours a week. To go directly to the, the question I think at hand is, uh, you know, that I would say should be in line with any full-time work. Um, so if you're working 40 hours a week, uh, you should have the resources you need uh, to, to pay for your expenses, uh, to take care of your health care, uh, and to take care of your family. Yeah. All right. We're almost out of time. Um, 
maybe to sum it up, what do you see as the next evolutionary step for the gig economy? We've talked about a lot of different ideas in the last 20 minutes, but what should people be watching for maybe in the coming months? Yeah, I think it's this uh, idea that's been talked about by many, for many years. Again, Senator Warner was ahead of most people talking about it, is a portable benefit. It's exciting. It's a big deal. The fact that Prop 22 added benefits for the first time in the United States for independent contractors is a big deal. The fact that you can now work whenever and wherever you want. You could not work for three weeks straight. You could not work for three months straight and come back. And when you do work, you can get benefits. That's a very big deal. Now, turning that into savings accounts uh, for Americans across the country who do this and want to do this type of work uh, is, a, is a really exciting moment uh, for, for work, uh, for economic growth and, and economic mobility. Uh, and so I, I think it's, uh, it's going to be there. Well, thank you so much, John Zimmer, for your time today and taking a lot of different reader questions. Uh, to our audience, please, yeah, please tune in later at 2 p.m. Eastern when David Ignatius will lead a discussion on the broadband gap, the internet and cell phone gap in the United States with the CEO of AT&T. Thank you.